link into our chat. Um, I didn't see a lot of topics come in, so if you have anything, just throw it in the chat. Um, I wanted to quickly start off with um, a comment on our structured logging revamp. So as of the last rebase, we have uh, the Kubernetes con contextual like structural logging uh, like all of the libraries and whatnot are in there. So I've been slowly changing stuff over. Um, if anyone's got free cycles and wants to spend a little bit of time, I would appreciate <laughs> some help on this. It's uh, very, very boring. Um, but once we're done, um, kind of the grand vision that I was <clears throat> really hoping for us to get to is when uh, an end-to-end -end test fails or you know some bug comes up, we should be able to go through the logs and filter down. I'd like to see all the logs for a particular reconciler, for a particular logical cluster, maybe even particular keys and whatnot, and you know, not spend as much time uh, sifting through stuff. So getting there would be super awesome. Um, we're pretty close. I think some of the virtual workspace uh, directories and the sinker are all that's left. So any help would be uh, appreciated. Um, before we jump into any of the more procedural stuff, does anyone have anything they want to bring up? I just need to leave earlier. I think there was one incoming issue assigned to me. So if if, if we get yeah. to that point and we could bump it up in the stack, that would be great. Cool. Um, Paul, did you have anything you want to talk about? Yeah, just one quick general announcement that I put on the issue. Uh, the second, September 2nd, is closing date for 0 0.8. So that means we're two weeks out and we need to start thinking about 0 0.9 items. I've linked in our work packages document. As usual, let's uh, put names to topics on there. I've copied over the items that will still be in development. So I think we have names by most things. Um, the other piece that we need to put in there is anything we want to design in 0 0.9 in preparation for 0 0.10. So take a look when you have a chance. We've got two weeks to kind of start talking through scoping on those things. And September 30th will be the close date for 0 0.9. We can jump into some of these issues that came in. Uh, this first one was a bug on creating new cluster workspaces. Um, it looks like we, I'll follow up here. Something internal didn't happen correctly. We didn't get the, uh, annotation uh, put on there correctly for the owner. Uh, yeah, so I'll follow up on this one. Um, let's see. Anyone except for Andy and Stefan have any idea what's going on with this from proxy topology issue? Barring this, uh, I'm going to keep it without a milestone because we probably want to come back to this when they're back. Oh, uh, sir. Yep. It pretty much, well, I just tried to read through the description of that stuff. It yep. looks auth related. Assign it to me. Maybe I can um, have a look at this one, at least comment and see what's going on there. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, okay, so this was an issue that came up. Um, so we, uh, 
Right, so when we have a partial metadata informer today, they ask for V1 beta one workspaces. Um, this gets redirected to the virtual workspace server, which when it's running as a separate entity has some sort of certificates issues. And there were some questions about why we're running with the topology we are, but I think for now we're gonna, there's benefits obviously to not having everything co-located because this works fine on loopback. Um, so in that case, who is doing the request? The client or the virtual? Uh, this is server? some, I think this is some of the uh, something in the controller manager using a loopback client. Hmm. I, I can take a look if no one else is interested. This is Vukash, the by the way. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And. I think the workaround, because this uh, they hit this in quota, I think the workaround was just to like not quota the virtual resource, but um, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna sign myself on this one. Uh, this was something that I hit trying to um, get a like fully end-to-end -end example running with the controller runtime uh, code. So right now, when we run the end-to-end -end tests, we're generally using either the KCP admin or the shard admin account, both of which are super highly privileged. And there's a lot of stuff that we just don't realize. Uh, and also, we're not really hitting all of the authorizer flows. Um, so at some point, we should probably, I actually, I'm not entirely certain what happens in uh, QBD for this one. So if somebody knows, it'd be good to know. Do, do tests request specific things in the service account for their namespace? Unless nobody answers. <laughs> Yep, most most of them are highly privileged. Um, in see. fact, yeah. So, in fact, I don't know if you saw, and that's also why I pulled you in, Steve. And the the PAR with the with the deep SAR, in fact, already starts using sort of like completely unprivileged users and creating roles and role bindings and stuff like this. So, I guess this is a gentle start towards it. I totally agree. We should use, leverage more um, service accounts and and the implied uh, permissions. Feel free to assign this one to me, although I feel this is like a very, very, very broad topic. And um, I think it makes sense to look at authorizers. And at the, like we have a test E2E tech package um, or an E2E run, which explicitly tests all authorizers and does pretty much unprivileged calls in there. And think we should add more stuff in there, but we should also think about concrete E2E test scenarios, um, what we want to test. Cause there's like, I guess like a combinatorial explosion of things we could theoretically test uh, with with constraints. So um, we should we should judge by a case by case basis. I guess that's my that's my call. And like the test E two E authorizes packages, the canonical source of things where we want to hit things unprivileged, so to say. But again, like the deep SAR E two E is a good canonical example of where we already start introducing these subtleties um, with unprivileged accounts. Yeah, and I think um, like outside of the authorizer EEs, we'd be less interested in the combinatorics of it. And I think it just gives us a really good um, insight into like user experience more so there. Actually, what I want to do is um, that's going to be one issue later uh, with currently the, the RBAC messages that we get are partially very confusing, right? So I, what I want to do is when I will improve the messaging, actually provide an E2E test, which will assert concretely RBAC uh, error messages, RBAC reasonings, 
uh, which come back in, in case of um, authorization violations. So I guess that could be a nice part of it. Um, Cool, let's see. Should we, let's just grab that one while we are here. This is what you were talking about, right? Yes, precisely. Yeah, so this, basically I was tired and this led me, the current message led me down like a bunch of rabbit holes that I never understood. Yes, definitely. and without adding debugging to the server, we would never yeah. have known. Yeah, I added myself in the deep SAR stuff. So again, like um, I think the deep SAR PR is good enough now, and I will jump into exactly this issue to improve messaging. Yep. And I wonder, because there's there's a tension here as well between like providing. So the context of the issue for everyone. Um, I, uh, I was, I think, yeah, I was trying to bind an API and the cluster workspace that the export existed in didn't exist. Um, and we are, there might be more that we can write, but what we, what we have um, in the error messages is also conservative not to give the user too much information, right? And I wonder if there's, do we have uh, good enough support in the audit traces now so that when an admin hits this, they can, okay. Exactly. That, that's the other issue I'm working on. <laughs> so we have some stuff that Andy uh, merged, I believe this week or last week, um, but I want to go through the remaining authorizers. I, I completely agree. We have to have like a good line of, like we want as much fine-grained information as we can just have in the audit logs. That's one thing. And we have to be a little bit careful not to leak too much stuff on the RBAC messaging back to the user, um, but be good enough that the user has some clue about what's going on, why the request failed because the authorization missed it. So I guess like this will be a like quite like a little bit of juggling and bike shedding on the PRs that I'm going to submit. But yeah, it's twofold. Like the, I'm working on the audit as well and uh, on the user-facing messages. And we just have to you know, look at the PR and, and see if we have a good line um, where we don't leak too much stuff on the regular reasons that come back to the user. Awesome. And I think there's, I imagine there's probably already tooling around this somewhere, but like a very quick um, CLI to query the audit to figure out, to go from I was the user making this request with this user agent all the way to like, that's my audit. You had, here's the reasons why it failed. Um, automating that in some sense might be also good. Um, but cool, awesome. So yeah, I think on, on those two fronts, that will be very useful. Um, let's see. Where did we, okay. Sergis, did you want to add anything to this? Sounds like storing group membership in some config maps in a privileged workspace while we have until we have support from the IDP. Um, I didn't look at this one. Just assign this one to me, and maybe I will um, sync back with okay with Chris. I wanted to meet him anyways, um, and then I can put in more details. But it sounds also like a good issue to me. But I will I will go back and talk with Chris because okay. I guess this is coming from that side.
Um, many off topics today. Yeah. So this one I'm uh, currently answering. Okay. In fact, I didn't push the comment button <laughs> for now, but uh, in fact, it has never been, it has, I mean, update for in the workspaces, virtual workspace has never been uh, implemented uh, from the beginning. So just the method is not here in the rest uh, implementation. Obviously, uh, now we have much more experience uh, than when it was written in virtual workspaces. So it would be quite straightforward to add. I think the most, I mean, the main part is really define what do we want the user to be able to change. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it has to be coupled with, you know, uh, and defining some rules, maybe to just change the labels, for example. So that's the main question, in fact. So let me just push what can do. Yeah, I'm sorry. And what did you want? the comment. Awesome. Um, David, do you have an idea of milestone for this one? Well, I don't know how critical it is, in fact. I mean, as soon as we, as long as we don't have precise or critical use cases to add labels, uh, you know, for end users, not sure it's it's heavily critical. So maybe yeah, I a good question. that into Cause like, TBD. I don't know pretty highly privileged to be able to go list workspaces anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, being able to change labels, uh, I don't know. I mean, to me, we should really define what are the use cases for this to be provided to an end user. Because if it's an admin, then he can just, you know, point to the cluster workspace. Right. Am I right that that it's it's there is no limitation that you can through an API binding uh, just bind a, a cluster workspace and directly work mm -hmm. with it if you have sufficient permissions? Yeah, so that that might be sufficient, I assume. I think nailing down to like a stance on what we expect, Like, and you kind of articulated it there, but it's like, if you're a user, you use V1 beta one, like the workspace, yeah. that's all you ever worry about. If you're an admin, you have the cluster workspace, then uh, two different setups. Sergius? Uh, just one note, David, uh, you effectively need the bind verb permission against um, the API export um, yeah. mm -hmm. in the original workspace. And using the deep star, you won't need general access to the API exporting mm. So you will just need this verb permission. So that might not be too cumbersome for that, for someone privileged to, to to have access to that. Okay. Yeah, I guess so. Cool. Um, this was a bug with the sinker deleting the root CA. I don't know if we ever I've merged, um, well, a fix for another issue that was kind of related to this because the sinker was missing a uh, name translation. So can you assign me this and I will check if, yeah, okay. thank you. Awesome. Yeah, and it says that this was name transformation, so maybe it was the same thing. Cool. Thanks, you, Kim. So okay, this maybe. one, I don't know if Jan is here. Yeah, th this the, the 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 last ones only serve compatible APIs and specify API export. And sync target, it's the 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 work Jan is is currently working on. The last one, as far as I know, I just updated the the description 
so the specify API export in sync target. Um, it seems it to me it's finished, but maybe I would let him just close the issue, uh, uh, or you know, if it's possible to ping him maybe tomorrow for someone uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, it seems to me that uh, the the two parts have been done. I, I just you know uh, also added the the, the last pull, the, the pull request for the second point uh, today earlier. Uh, then there is, uh, sorry, yeah, but yes, and this is this one is a follow up uh, of, of the previous ones. He is currently working on it. Uh, as soon as you <coughs> can point to external API export from uh, Sync Target, then we have to change the Sync virtual workspace to explicitly get the Sync, the API exports mentioned by the Sync Target instead of checking everything that is in the current workspace. So that's something is working on. I assume it should be. So it, it, it should be um, in 0 0.8, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I believe. Oh, it was in, sorry. Uh, I believe you put those in scope for 9.12s, 0 0.8 delivers, 17, 77, 78, and 79. Oh, all of them, OK. For this, oh sorry, excuse me. Uh, this one is yeah, yeah. This one is the you know last follow up after the previous one. That's mainly uh, because when you point to external uh, external API exports from a thing target, there is a, a check that the corresponding uh, thinkers correctly support uh, correctly imported the schemas. In the in the sync target workspace, and then we check that the schemas are compatible. The idea is that if you have a location workspace, you know a sync target, well, a location workspace that has bound to external APIs, we have to check that those APIs we want to use are also present in the physical cluster and are compatible. And we would only schedule a given workload of these um, APIs only for uh, sync targets where this API is compatible inside the, uh, the physical cluster. So that's quite important in case, um, yeah, you, you, you have a sync target that joins that has, you know, mainly possibly a distinct uh, cube version than the T the, with incompatible schema corresponding to the you know, common cube that, that API exports that we will rely on in the future, for example. But that's the do main schedule. Schedule what, um, do we have a sketch of what it looks like when no compatible sync targets exist? Well, you just don't get the, I mean, the APIs. So, so it, it will not be scheduled. Sorry, I meant, um, sorry. Uh, from the user perspective, if I created a deployment, I expected it to go somewhere, but I don't have any valid sync targets. Will that deployment get a status update? No, and obviously, I don't remember. We have to check that, but it seems to me that uh, it would have some sort of um, condition that it, it has not been synchronized. So it would okay. it it would stay in the same state as it would if uh, you would not have uh, assigned any location, for example. Okay. I mean cool. that's my guess, but <laughs> should probably check. Okay. So this awesome. one is yes, zero to eight as well. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that was all that we had. Um, so. These are the epics we've got running through here. Um, it doesn't look like we've had an update 
Um, Paul, do you know if we if we have an update on Priority and Fairness? Oh, I guess it got moved to 0.9. Yeah, I went through and tried to update some of these yesterday. We need to see if we can talk to Sean about progress on the permission claims one. Um, okay. And I, I think the other thing to mention here is if you do have something that is not going to land in the next two weeks, or you're pretty sure it's not going to land, we need to try and start scoping those out um, within the Epic itself or, or moving the Epic to the next fixed version. So if anyone has topics like that right now that they want to discuss with the community, then uh, now's a good time. Yeah, I guess none of these seem to have any updates um, except for this one that got punted off. So do you think it's worth us jumping into these or should we just um, do it in the issues themselves? I would love to have the issue descriptions updated since that's kind of where the system of record for scoping is, but if people are, are looking for help, this is a good venue for it. Okay, doesn't sound like we have anything we, uh, we need to talk about right now then, let's follow up on these um i chatted with sean yesterday paul so i can i can follow up on the export stuff i know andy took over um some of that thanks cool um open floor in case anyone has any other topics but i think that's all we had on the agenda for today awesome thanks everyone for coming we'll see you guys in, in a week thanks everyone Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.